Good afternoon, everybody. It's been a good conference so far. What do you think? I've really enjoyed it. We talked about a lot of good things, selenium related and some non selenium related. I thought that robot was about the neatest thing ever. <laughs> Holy cow. Didn't expect to see that when we flew over here. Um, it's good to be with you this afternoon. Our talk today is called Massively Continuous Integration. We borrow that term massively from the video game world. I don't know how many of you have ever been to a LAN party, maybe back in the day, played some Quake or some Doom, and uh, you'd get together with your friends and you might have four machines or six machines and you thought you were great because you could network those few machines together and, and enjoy your game, but then along came the massive multiplayer games and that was when things went from a few boxes in somebody's basement to thousands and thousands of computers all over the world, all networked, doing one thing together. And uh, when it comes to continuous integration and integrating at a massive scale, you need that same level of horsepower. And so uh, as we talk today, what we're going to be sharing with you is the experience that we had taking our continuous integration system from something like a LAN party with a master and a few slaves to a massive solution incorporating hundreds and hundreds of, of servers um, and drove thereby driving down the cycle time in our organization from, like I said, three days to 30 minutes. So a little bit about who we are. Um, uh, my colleague David and I, we work for Attask. It's a software company based in Utah. So we're, we're a little ways from home today. Um, we're a SaaS company. We've been around for about 10 years, and what we do is project management and work management software. So think everything from your task list and your daily work all the way to your issue tracking, all the way up to executive dashboards and reportability and that kind of thing. That's the space that we're in. So we sell to the enterprise, and as a result, we have some interesting and unique challenges. Um, it's been great to be a part of an organization like that that's, that is what we feel like on the cutting edge, or at least always looking to be on the cutting edge. And we both uh, also enjoy the view that you get there. That's pretty close to where we live. So it's, it's a nice place to live and work um, and good people to work with. As I said, my name is Jesse Dowell. I'm the manager of development at Attask. Is this mic? Whoa. We're recording. Sorry, guys. <laughs> okay, I'm the manager of development at Attask. Um, I'm responsible for the continuous integration platform and the efforts of our engineering teams on the product. And David is uh, a senior QA automation engineer. So the, the two of us have been at work on this project. It's really a, a cross collaboration between the de development and engineering team, or the development and QA teams at Attask, and uh, it's an exciting thing to be a part of. Just to give you an idea of what we're doing with Selenium right now, I don't know how this stacks up to what you have, but we feel like we have quite a few Selenium tests, about 1,100 Selenium 1 tests, which are legacy tests. They cover our old application, so we keep them there for regression. Uh, testing, and then we also have 800 Selenium 2 tests, and that's a living test suite. So we're adding appreciably to that number every single sprint. We spend somewhere in the neighborhood of 40,000 machine hours on Selenium every single month. So I think it's fair to say we're really committed to what's going on in the Selenium world right now. And the reason we use it that much is because not only are we using it for certification for releases, but we're we're using it in our continuous integration. And when you start talking about 2,000 Selenium tests running every single check-in, it starts to add up pretty quickly. Uh, hold on here. I think I hit the back button. There we go. <coughs> so before, if it, just to rewind the tape a little bit to talk about where we came from and, and then we'll talk about where we're going. Um, when we first started with Selenium years and years ago, we started with a lot of scripted scenario tests. Those tended to be rather slow. They were prone to breaking. A lot of the talks today have talked about different reasons why Selenium tests break, and I think it's fair to say we've seen all of those. Um, we use those tests to certify our monthly releases, and it would usually take somewhere in the neighborhood of three to five days to certify a build. Now, to give you an idea of what that would be like, the engineers would finish. They'd say they were code complete, and the QA team would run the Selenium tests. That would take somewhere in the neighborhood of four hours. Now, out of that would come a set of failures, 50 failures, 100 failures, somewhere in that neighborhood, which would then have to be parsed through test by test, looking for the reason why the failure occurred. You probably can relate to this. We'd take those failures and rerun them, and we'd rerun them with the suite, and inevitably new tests would come in. And so we'd do this over and over again for up to three, four, or five days. 
and eventually we would decide, okay, we're satisfied with the result, we're going to move forward. So our automation was very manual, if there is such a thing. Now, uh, the, with the test suite that we have, um, that we're running today, they're much tighter, they're shorter, you'll see that in the presentation. They're less prone to break, and we use them daily. Our releases take about 30 minutes to certify, and so we're able to ship code almost every single day of the week, um, sometimes multiple times in a day. It's really been a radical transition from us, from, for us, from going from once a month all the way down to several times uh, in a week, and sometimes more than once in a day. You might ask, okay, well, why did we, why did we decide to make that transition? What was the catalyst for that? Uh, ultimately, what it was is uh, we missed a release date. Our three to five days, that buffer that we built into the end of every iteration wasn't enough one time, and we pushed beyond our release date and missed, uh, missed a key deliverable. And we had to ask ourselves some pretty hard questions about our continuous integration and whether we were really, truly integrated. So. Maybe let me ask you guys a question. How many of you have continuous integration in your systems right now? Almost everybody. Okay, re really good. Um, how often is all of the code that's going to be deployed merged together on, say, master or trunk? How often is all of it integrated? More than once a day? A few hands, okay. Every, like, twice a day? Every hour? Every check-in? Okay, we've got a few hands in here. Excellent. Next question. How do you know you're integrated? What does the test suite look like? And that's rhetorical. I won't make you shout it out. But do the tests that you run at commit mirror the tests that you run when you need to release? And is it the same set of tests? In other words, does everything that you need to know to release present itself to you each and every check-in? Is every check-in a potential release candidate? Those are hard questions, and we had to answer no to every one of those. And so to come up with a solution to those problems, we had to give ourselves what sometimes we call a BHAG. Maybe you've heard of that before. It's a big, hairy-ass goal. We knew that we needed to drive the cycle time down dramatically to give, uh, to give ourselves a prayer of being able to release. And the corollary to that is, is massive scale. You just can't run 2,000 Selenium tests in 15 minutes just doesn't happen. Your grid is just not going to survive. Um, visibility was a big problem for us as well. We knew since we weren't running the Selenium tests as often as we should that the engineering team just frankly didn't know when things were breaking. You know, it's not good enough to run a test two weeks after the code was committed that broke it and then try and backtra backtrace <coughs> the original uh, committer. You've got to have that right up front, right at the beginning. And related to that is accountability. I think the two go hand in hand. We knew in our organization that we needed to help each engineer be accountable for the results of the code that they checked in. And the best way to do that was let them see the tests right up front. So we came up with a little mnemonic device, build, deploy, test, destroy. And uh, this diagram is a, an approximation of the way that we do things. When a commit comes into our version control system, we have a polling mechanism that detects that within a minute or so and immediately starts to spin off multiple jobs. Um, we build the installer for at task. Um, we actually use RPM for that, but we build, we build the at task application installer and we also build a, our, uh, a, not a binary, but a zip file of all the tests that we want to run, the thousands of tests that we have. At the same time, we reach out to the cloud and we start spinning up infrastructure out in the cloud. So Selenium Grid, our at task application, David's going to talk a lot more about the details involved with that. While that installation is happening out in the cloud, we run our unit tests and we run our integration tests, which are also sharded. So the question about cycle time, right? When do engineers start to get feedback on their commit? It's within two or three minutes. They start getting unit test feedback and local test feedback. But all the while, we're prepping for Selenium. We're getting the system ready to support that. Once the grids and the, and the at task application are up and running in the cloud, we run Seleniums for both IE and Firefox in parallel, and we also run some other tests against that infrastructure. And then when it's done, we aggregate the test results and tear the entire thing down uh, ready again for the next set. So to continue on with the details about each of these aspects uh, of, the, of our goal, performance, scalability, Visibility and accountability, David Tolley. Hey, how's it going, everyone? Um, Do you want to walk yeah. over here? Yeah. 
So, like a lot of you, I had to fly to get to London. So we get to the airport Saturday morning, you know, there's a big line at the security uh, point already. So it takes me about 10 minutes to get through that line. And, you know, all the while I'm thinking, you know, this is horrible, right? I mean, they're not scalable, you know, in, I, in, I, in an ideal situation, you know, every time, you know, there was someone in line, um, a new security officer would come up and, you know, that way, you know, no one had to wait to get through that checkpoint. Um, ideally, what you want to happen is, you know, whenever uh, your demand goes up, the amount of resources that you have, you need to scale as well. Uh, that way, you know, no matter what demand that you have on your system, you're able, uh, always able to cope with that. Um, and once you get, um, as you saw before, you know, we had a couple of serial steps that had to happen. I mean, you can't test the, uh, the interface of an application until, you know, it's compiled, right? But once you get past those uh, serial steps, you need to break out into as many different parallel paths as possible. Um, one of the big reasons for that is you need to run your test suites in a, a parallel fashion. Um, uh, the, the big reason for that is cycle time, right? Um, if you're running all of your tests back to back to back, your cycle time is huge. Um, the time that it takes for a developer to commit uh, before they're able to get test results back, you know, is the sum of every single one of the lengths of your test suites. Now, if you're running everything in parallel, uh, your cycle time is, is really cut down. Um, if all your tests run at the same time, your cycle time then becomes um, the single longest running test suite that you have. Um, so how did we uh, create a pipeline that would do all this for us? Uh, we chose Jenkins with a, uh, an Amazon integration for uh, scalability. Uh, to show you a little bit of you know, how this happens for us, uh, as Jesse mentioned, we're constantly pulling our Git repository. Uh, anytime we detect a, a new code check-in, uh, we tell Jenkins, hey, we need to run all of our tests against this new code. You, you have a lot of jobs that you need to do. You need to build, you need to build the tests, you need to run the Selenium tests, the integration tests. You have a lot of stuff you need to do. Um, so Jenkins says, hey, you know, I don't have enough service to run all these tests. So what it does is it reaches out to Amazon, um, dynamically allocates a, a slave test runner, and it runs all of those tests on the, uh, the test runners. Now, this way, you know, no matter how many commits are happening at the same time, uh, you always have enough resources to, to handle the load. And um, one of the things we found out early on uh, working with Amazon is it's really expensive. Um, you know, if you don't deallocate the slaves that you dynamically allocated, your bill is going to skyrocket. You know, Jesse's going to talk to you a little bit about that later on, but uh, we'll go on from there. Um, the subtitle to our presentation is from three days to 30 minutes. And the biggest um, thing that we did uh, to shorten that time, as Jesse mentioned, was our Selenium uh, re-architecture. Uh, we went from Selenium 1 to Selenium 2. Now, our Selenium 1 suite had around 1,800 tests uh, originally. And, um, it, you know, they're really long, really slow, really brittle tests. You know, they take about four hours to run. Then we'd have to verify the other uh, test failures, and it was a really long process. So what we did is uh, we switched from Selenium 1 to Selenium 2. And when we did that, um, all of our Selenium 1 tests, you know, they were really long, you know. It wasn't, you know, uncommon to see a test that had, you know, two or 300 lines in it. And every single line had some sort of selector, you know, CSS or XPath. And uh, all the Selenium calls were done within the test itself. So when we switched to Selenium 2, as you saw from, you know, a couple of different talks today, uh, we abstracted all of those selectors, all of those Selenium interactions into the page objects. Um, that, so now really all our tests do, they run get and set actions and then they verify some sort of result. So we went from a, a test that would be 100 lines of code to, you know, down to, you know, 10 or 15 lines of code. Um, what that did for us is we also shrunk down our uh, test suite from, you know, around 1,800 tests to about 750 tests. And now they run in about 30 minutes. Now, uh, you might say, okay, you went from 1,800 down to 750, you know, what happened to all your covers that you used to have? When we went through our old Selenium 1 suite, we found that a lot of tests that we had were duplicates of each other. Um, and, you know, one Selenium test did the same thing that another one did, you know, uh, a new, uh, in a different class, or we tested that same thing in a different test layer that ran faster than Selenium. Um, so we took those 1,800 tests and we went down to about 1,100 tests. Um, but as Jesse mentioned, they were on our old uh, interface. And so we don't really need to run those on every check-in. So we run them on a timer that runs every hour. And the only tests that we run uh, per check-in are the 750 Selenium 2 tests that run against Firefox and Internet Explorer. 
so, you know, basically what happened was, you know, in Selenium 1, each test took about, you know, two minutes to run. But in Selenium 2, since we, uh, we streamlined, you know, what they're really doing, they're down to about 34 seconds now. And since we use the grid, you know, we, we love to be parallel, we love to you know, run things, you know, in a parallel process. We have 16 threads that run on our Selenium tests. Um, so before, a test was finishing in about eight seconds, and now they're finishing in about two and a half seconds. So a pretty big reduction. Now, um, when we decided to do this <coughs> continuous integration process, we needed a way to, to guarantee that each uh, commit had the right amount of RCs to, you know, to test against. And we also need to make sure that the environment that it tested against always had a pristine state. You know, there wasn't any past data corruption or anything. You always want a clean environment to test against. Um, so what we did uh, was use cloud formations. Now, cloud formations are, are an Amazon term. It's basically a virtual test bed that you create by uh, creating a, a JSON file. Now, in that file, you specify, uh, you know, what images you want to use, what security settings you want to use, how you want them to start up. And then Amazon starts all of those instances up for you, connects them, and you're able to test against it. So uh, as Jesse mentioned, uh, right after commit, we start up these cloud formations. You know, that way, whenever we actually do get to our Selenium tests, it has all the resources available that it needs to, to run against. So what happens is you know, a slave says, hey, I need to run these Selenium tests. Um, it sends that recipe file to Amazon, and it creates those cloud formations. And then in those cloud formations, we have an instance of that, instance of that task to run against, and we have two uh, dynamic Selenium grids. Um, both Firefox and Internet Explorer. Then that dynamic slave uh, sends all the tests to those grids and it uh, interacts with that newly created at task instance, you know, guaranteeing that each commit has the resources it needs and it doesn't have to wait to get those resources. Now, Jesse mentioned that, you know, we run about 40,000 machine hours, um, you know, per month uh, to test our Selenium uh, suite. Uh, how that happens is each commit gets these two cloud formations. Um, as I said, you know, to be scalable, we, we wanted to have the right amount of RCs always available, you know, per check-in. Um, so at any one time, you can have, you know, 10, 20, you know, 30 cloud formations um, always available, you know, to run our tests against. So, you know, I've talked to a couple of people here and, you know, one of the biggest problems people have with uh, Jenkins is visibility. Um, if you haven't used it before, you know, the, the main visibility sucks, right? You have to click into a build, you have to go to like this console, uh, console output, you have to click through different links to, you know, find your test results. It's, it's not easy to use. Uh, so we decided to create two different uh, plugins that interact with each other to create a pretty awesome uh, view. So the first one is a, a description plugin. And what this does is it allows you to set the description of a job at runtime to anything you want. Uh, we chose the, uh, the git author and the git revision, then um, you saw in our pipeline uh, the commit job spawns, you know, all these other jobs. And every job that's uh, spawned off that commit job uh, gets the, the same description. The actual view plugin then, you know, it searches through all the different jobs, uh, it finds the jobs that have the same description, and it puts it in one easy to use dashboard. So as you can see here, a developer can look at this and say, hey, you know, I checked in right here, you know, this is the revision I checked in, you know, here's my commit, and here's every single test that ran against that commit, you know, all in one easy to view uh, location. And also, if there's a test failure, they can click into that link, um, go to their uh, test results page, and, you know, see their stack traces and, you know, find out, you know, why it broke, broke this test. Now, you know, once we had all these tests running, you know, really quickly, and we had the visibility that we wanted, uh, we needed to take care of accountability. And so what we did is we created a, uh, an at task plugin that integrated with Jenkins. Uh, so now anytime a test fails, uh, at task will create an issue for that test, assign it to whoever committed on that particular run, and uh, send them a notification saying that they broke a test. So then the, the developer is able to go into that task, um, see what test they broke, see the stack trace of that test that they broke, uh, they're able to work on it and tell us that, hey, you know, I understand that I broke this test, I'm going to work on it. And then whenever they, uh, uh, whenever they uh, commit a fix for it, uh, at task will also update itself um, and set the issue to a resolve status and notify the developer that you fixed this test, you don't need to work on it anymore. No congratulations. Now, 
it took a long time to uh, to develop all this and you know integrate everything together and get it exactly uh, how you wanted to, and um, it, it didn't happen overnight. So let me turn this over to Jesse and uh, he can wrap this up. Thanks. Yeah, one of the things that we learned really quick getting started with this is that it's complicated. <laughs> You've got a lot of different systems that have to play well with each other in order to make uh, a continuous integration pipe that's, that's just dynamic uh, the way this is work successfully. And we learned that the primary place where that tended to break down is on the integration points. For example, with Amazon, uh, they have a great set of APIs for starting up machines, but what doesn't happen uh, is or often won't happen is that different services on those machines don't always start up in the same amount of time. So SSH, for example, is problematic there. You can start the machine up, but SSH isn't going to come online for another 20 or 30 seconds. And so our scripts had to have some built-in loopback or some, some redundancy to wait for SSH. Um, another example would be artifact, uh, artifact repositories with Jenkins. I don't know if any of you have used Jenkins uh, artifact storage stuff, but it tends to have a problem. Sometimes it locks up sending artifacts back to the master node. So, um, you know, timely plugins and uh, effort in terms of performance tuning Jenkins was a big help as well. Another thing that we realized pretty early on is that um, our team, which is primarily Java developers, um, didn't necessarily have all the core competencies to be really successful sysadmins, which is sort of what you need when you're dealing with this kind of hardware. So um, some bash scripting and a little bit of Perl goes a long way with this kind of thing. And getting folks that are from that background helps, uh, helps increase the likelihood of success. You know, another thing that we ran into um, with the old system was that we had, you know, we had continuous integration, but the process didn't really reinforce the use of that tool. So you tended to get a little bit of grumbling from the engineering team. The QA team maybe wasn't the best ones equipped to even uh, maintain or support those tools. And this time around, we've, I think we've learned our lesson. We've incorporated some of the dashboards that David showed and information radiators around our office. At the state of Jenkins is a topic at the, the daily stand-ups, and we have a, a global team. We're distributed um, around the world, and so people on the other side of the planet are using Jenkins and sending status updates to the U.S. developers and vice versa. So we're sort of all in this together to keep the build green. The last thing is um, that I wanted to make specific mention of is that um, it, it takes continual investment. It's not something that you can just stand up, put it on a box under somebody's desk, and expect that in six months or a year, it's going to magically evolve with your code base and still work as well as it did at the start. So you have to plan to spend a little money um, on a system like this going forward. For us, we've chosen to create a two-person team, uh, create a CI team, David and his colleague, um, who are dedicated to making our continuous integration system sing. And uh, they've become so mission critical now that they're, they're right at the hub of all the activity in our engineering team. Um, at the same time, you know, we have to pay the piper when it comes to that cloud infrastructure. Hundreds and hundreds of machines don't come cheap. So it takes, you know, I think it's fair to say eight to $10,000 a month for us for the number of machine hours we spend. And that's, that's a fair amount of money. There are things you can do to help with that. You can performance tune the machine sizes themselves. You have some flexibility with most cloud providers in terms of how much compute, memory, and disk you want to use for each machine. And so finding the ideal amount for each machine is really helpful. Um, there are examples where, like in the case of grids, they consume so little resources, the hub of the Selenium grid, that we can run it on a micro, and then the browsers can run on mediums or larges, depending on how many, how many browser windows we have running. Um, Teardown is another one that we already talked about. Our system tears itself down, but we also have a reaping script that goes through and just makes double sure that everything gets nuked. Um, elasticity is such an important part of the cost model for this type of continuous integration that you really have to focus on it. I can tell you that when no one's committing uh, new code at task, the cost from Amazon for our system is 20 cents an hour. So it's virtually free when it's not being used, and then when it is being used, it has the ability to scale up in dramatic fashion. So just for a quick back of the napkin math, got a couple more minutes here. Um, let me give you an idea of what the ROI actually looks like for this. Let's pretend that we had a five-day certification process. I use that as a kind of an extreme example at the beginning, but let's just go with me. 
Um, you have 10 engineers, we'll say they're 40 bucks an hour. Maybe your guys may make a lot more money than that. Depends on where they're located around the world or whatever, right? But you're going to end up spending somewhere in the neighborhood of $20,000 for those 10 engineers for five days. 30 minutes to certify a release, 10 engineers, 40 bucks an hour, right? It's less than $250. But wait, you say, what about all the other costs that were associated with that continuous integration? Yeah, those are there, but those are fixed costs. So we, you know, we looked at it. If we released 12 times a year, monthly, like we were doing before, it's going to cost $240,000 to do it the old way. But if we, if we spend our 160 on salaries for engineers and another you know, one FTE for continuous integration and a little bit on tests, that, that comes out to about the same number. But what gets really interesting is when you start to increase the number of deliveries you're making, the number of certified builds. Because the, the fixed cost stays fixed and what's, what's the, the cost that increases with the builds is a lot smaller percentage. So 24 times a year you can see there it's 480 grand, it's almost a half a million bucks. 6,000 is all though for the testing side. At 100 times a year, um, it starts to get really impressive. You know, we feel like 100 times a year is pretty much daily when you get to weekends and holidays and things like that. You know, if you're releasing 100 times a year as a SaaS vendor, you're doing pretty well. That cost us $2 million to do with the old stuff, which is just cost prohibitive. There's no way we'd be able to do it. But with the, the continuous integration system, we think it will cost us somewhere in the neighborhood of a tenth of that. So this is the future, guys. Virtualization is the future. And, and virtualization in-house is really great. That's terrific. And if you happen to have an operations department that's really responsive to your needs and gets you hardware the moment you request it as much as you need, then maybe you're the first person I've met that has that. <laughs> um, but the cloud isn't that way. You can pay them five cents an hour or 10 cents an hour for a computer and they just provide it. No questions asked. It's all automated. And, uh, and so for us, it's really been a game changer. Um, if this has piqued your interest and there are some things that you want to go do in your organization, here's some great next steps, some things we're looking at as well. ThoughtWorks is obviously a thought leader in the continuous delivery space. They've got some great stuff. We've heard from some people that have been talking about those principles here today. The broader aspect of application lifecycle management is a great counterpoint to continuous integration. If you can take what you're doing with CI and extend that to deploy so it goes all the way out the door in a fully automated fashion, then you see those savings continue to roll. And there are a lot of good open source solutions that we're actually exploring right now as well for certain parts of our deployment pipeline. OpenStack's one if you're interested in taking a look. Um, the plugins that we've shown you today, most of them are available right now. You can go on GitHub if you want to Take a look at the description plugin and the pipeline view for Jenkins. That's really helped us out. And we've submitted patches, or I guess a pull, pull request is what we call those, to, uh, to EC2 and the cloud formation, the rest of that stuff. The at test plugin's coming soon. But um, with that, I think we're done. So thank you, and we're ready to take any questions you have. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, the cloud formation right now has a limitation in it where it spawns instances serially instead of in parallel. So one of the reasons that we, we broke into two cloud formations and we, why we actually have two grids is because we get sequential but split. Um, and our build environment takes a few minutes to create the installer, build the test files, zip them, send them along. So we know that it takes about the same amount of time for all the prep and we just performance tune each of those parallel steps to make them uh, take about the same amount of time. Yep. Can you run CI iterations in parallel? I mean, it's just taking 30, 40 minutes to do an iteration. Mm -hmm. uh, in 30, 40 minutes, developers can obviously check in their code. Yeah, so everything that we showed you, yeah, sorry, to, didn't mean to cut you off there. Everything that we showed you is parallel. So. Um, yeah, the, the grid that showed the two, the two uh, Selenium uh, grids, the at task environment, the slave. There's actually four or five of those slaves because they're running sharded, te sharded tests. That represents one commit by one developer. And we, we consume about 150 commits a day. So you see that repeated about 150 times. Uh, 
Well, we came across that because uh, the size of the instance that we, we uh, run to, want to run against on EC2 um, could only handle about 16 total threads. Um, we, we didn't want to increase it because it, the return on investment, you know, it just wasn't worth the money to use a bigger instance. Um, so then we break that up to eight IE threads and eight Firefox threads, in a, and it runs really quick for us. If we ever just did decide that we, we didn't care about the money and, you know, we could increase that size, you know, then we could just throw more threads against it. Yeah, I think the low CD sort of started, it doesn't stay on about four threads, so, right. I mean, yeah, mm -hmm. that wasn't it, so. Yeah. yeah. Do you ever do anything with spot instances to lower the cost? You know, we haven't done anything with spot yet, but we, we are doing some, some work with reserved instances. So that for those of you that, that maybe haven't heard that term before, basically with Amazon, you're allowed to spend a certain amount as a prepay and then pay a lower hourly rate. So for example, like a large Windows machine might cost you $650 annually for you pay up front and then you pay like 20 cents an hour or 10 cents an hour instead of 40. So it's like half the cost. You sort of have to do the math yourself, especially with a system like this where we rarely have a machine online longer than 30 minutes, right? They spin up, they get used, and they spin down. And so you have to figure out how many hours of the day you're using those machines and then find the, the best balance. But there are, there are great ways to save a lot of money. I think the first time that we looked real closely at reserved, we found that we would be even under our forecasted budget. Um, so that was a nice thing to have happen. Yeah? Um, did you look at in any way at um, being more intelligent about which tests you run. Mm -hmm. it, it sounds like there is one test suite, that's the one that gets run. Mm -hmm. But maybe that's half of that's completely irrelevant depending on what's being changed, where the commit is. Yeah, it's, it's a step that we're not there with yet, but it's a great idea. You know, some of the things that we do are make sure that the tests that run the quickest get run first. So the cycle time aspect of that is there to make sure the feedback is quick. But from a cost savings perspective, we haven't explored smaller suites for more surgical changes to the code base. Now, what does the pre-commit build look like? What are you testing before <laughs> Check the wind. <laughs> yeah, we aren't pre-commit -test, uh, pre testing yet. We've looked at Garrett which is a, an option I hear for doing that with Git. We had pre-tested commit when we were with Team City um, and, and made a decision that we would put that on hold while we got the rest of this running. But I think that that model fits really well with this. If you, uh, if you, you, maybe you correct me on this, if you stop the commit job while it's still building, I think that pretty much nukes it, doesn't it? Yeah, so you have the time when the machines are starting up and the build, the compile is going. Like if compilation fails, for example, it doesn't go out and try and run the tests. It just call, tells Amazon, whoa, sorry, man, and it <laughs> tears the stuff down. Um, we also, you know, we fudge a little bit. It's every commit, but we do put a one minute window in there for the, the oops check-in right after. So yeah, there's a tiny threshold in there. OK. Thanks, guys. Oh, wait. Sorry, one more. No, sorry. So how much time is it needed to rewrite 2,000 of tests? You know, it's not so easy to get budget on that. <laughs> <laughs> Great question. So what we, uh, so fortunately, we didn't have to write, rewrite all 2,000. We had the old application UI and the new application UI. And we had written about 600 tests for the new application. So we had 600 that we had to go through. But the way that we did it is we took an engineering, an engineering team, six engineers and some QA folks, and we sliced up the new, the new application UI into wedges and said, you do the documentation for this piece, you do it for this piece. They did all the test documentation. So they created all the test plans and logged them all as tickets, like, like bugs every single one, and then they went back through all 600 of them and just automated to the documentation one after another. By the end of the iteration, they were doing about 20 tests a day that they were automating. So it took about one sprint, so about three or four weeks to redo about 600 tests that way. Cool. Well, thank you very much for attending.